morning. So Mike and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, the shape and the size of the market. Um, and I want to reiterate the baseball game is going to be great tonight, so please do join us. I'm looking forward to talking to all of you. I'm going to be up here a lot today, but I do want to know and get to uh, start talking about uh, the local on-demand economy with you all. We're going to be doing several things to, to augment this program, uh, one of which is launching a weekly podcast uh, about the local on-demand economy. And I'd like to each of you to consider uh, being a guest on that show as well. So uh, again, please come to the game. Come up and introduce yourself. Uh, we're looking forward to helping you and ourselves build this into a very substantial community. Um, the local on-demand organization, oh, there it is. Um, let's catch up. Uh, is, a, uh, is designed to keep human and technical resources working for customers at maximal profit while keeping labor engaged and evolving its skills. Really, it's the growth of labor that we're talking about here, the opportunity to help people uh, find new ways to deploy their skills and to, and to bring this, is that better? Okay. Uh, to deploy their skills and to bring more money into their own homes so that they themselves can participate in this on-demand economy. Um, it also calls upon a core feature of the American ethos that I think that the industrial economy has muted, and that's the importance of individual initiative. And I think that's going to come through as we talk about this all day long. There's a great deal of controversy about whether or not this is the right way or wrong way for us to organize labor. But what I think we need to think about is how do we uh, evolve our work styles to continue to uh, take advantage of the technology that we're de that's developing all around us and that we ourselves are developing. So I think we're standing at the brink of the logical and inevitable result of the first 50 years of digitization. It's adaptation as a species that we're doing. Uh, more value is concentrated at the edge of the network now in small and medium-sized businesses among networks of individual workers than any company could marshal to respond to them. Um, citizens have more power. Uh, excuse me, I just said that. Uh, we can now think in terms of mixing and matching millions of supply chains to address people individually. And it might maybe even correct to say that we've evolved a new system for using the resources that society has available to it. B.I. Kelsey refers to this economic shift as local because to be successful, on-demand services must address the customers where they are, wherever they are. The local economy is entirely cons uh, consumer-centric. And taken this way, the oft-asked question in local media, what is the definition of local, which is cast as a question of which channel to purchase, uh, has a very simple answer. The customer defines their own locality. My version of local has changed three times this week, and it's up to the companies that want to do business with me to provide services to me to keep up, and not only to keep up about where I am, but across the multiple devices I use. It's also important to note that this reorientation of markets around local relationships marks the end of the 40-year enterprise monopoly on deep logistical insight into systems and the value chains that gave corporations tremendous leverage over both labor and retailers. We've talked about the death of Main Street for many years. Uh, it's not entirely a coincidence that since 1964, when the IBM System 360, the first uh, commercially produced mainframe was introduced, productivity has raced ahead of workers' hourly compensation. In fact, it's only gotten worse since the banking collapse of 2008. And throughout that same period, businesses have been hammered by enterprise computing-enabled, single-sourced supply chains that exemplified by organizations like Walmart or Starbucks and copied by many others. Uh, we've talked about the death of Main Street over and over since the internet was introduced about uh, 25 years ago. What I think we're looking at is the opportunity to regrow Main Street. So why is this economic transition happening now? Didn't this digital revolution already take place? Well, I think the inter internet shows that, um, excuse me, uh, it's taken a while, but software is helping to perfect logistics. And I think logistics could be called the oldest organizational profession of them all. Writing actually developed from accounting tokens in Mesopotamia and Egypt. 
And 5,600 years later, the internet is showing the power of digitization, but it itself relied on industrial values and priorities. The convenience it delivered was based on standardization. There were standardized products sold to customers through interruptive advertising. Uh, it was inserted into mass-produced entertainment, or into sports, and even financial programming. Uh, these were all stock-first and sell-later businesses, supply-side businesses, that hoped to find a target for their pre-manufactured goods. But the supply-side uh, industrial model gave corporations tremendous power, which you can see in the uh, divergence of uh, compensation and, and productivity. Now is the time for a small capitalism to grow at the roots of the economy and for global organizations to adapt to the people power below them in the network, really to, to, to let the root system regrow for a robust American economy. The Internet also showed us the power of code in shaping community, culture, and commerce. Uh, we're getting very good at programming. Coders, like their peers in biotechnology, are literally tearing apart living systems, unwinding them and rebuilding them uh, in flight, so to speak. We are living through this uh, efflorescence of uh, human creativity that's uh, aided by computing power and in which changes can be made daily. And some of the companies today, Facebook and the like, they're pushing code 80, 100, 800 times a day sometimes. And that level of experimentation is giving us an opportunity to try many more solutions to the problems of living quickly than we have ever had in the past. And finally, we think that the local on-demand economy could resolve this five-decade divergence by transferring um, control of complex supply chains and knowledge both to local businesses and individual workers to use on behalf of customers. Um, the $15 an hour minimum wage movement, which is sweeping the nation right now, is growing because I think people recognize that they're working harder than ever. However, the response to that will be uh, something that's difficult for labor to swallow in response, and that is there's pay will only be forthcoming when work is actually needed. You won't be paid to sit around and wait to be productive anymore. Um, in the enterprise, on-demand is probably going to emerge as a tool for organizational flexibility, and there, bench-warming middle management uh, really needs to be aware of the fact that their roles are in trouble as well. The bottom line is that companies must recognize that on-demand labor flexibility comes at a cost. If you outsource, you pay a premium for that flexibility. So we've known for the past five years, since the arrival of the first crowdsourcing sites, that we're at the end of designing stuff and hoping we can sell it later. This isn't to say that originality will be monopolized by the crowd. Rather, originality will be recognized and rewarded with demand-based signals. So, put it simply, customers will be able to say, make more of that in response to even the rudest prototypes. And allowing for that rapid iteration, uh, companies will be able to move toward a popular design, one that's adopted and purchased by many more people quickly. Ideas will gain currency and products will gather traction from their inception, not simply at the time you manage to get it to market to see whether or not someone will buy what you've made. Um, there's another important facet to, to demand-based commerce to point out, and that is just as all of us can rate a restaurant today, we'll soon be able to examine the products that we buy for the ethical sourcing or residues of, of uh, slave labor or negative ecological uh, consequences that we can't support with our money and so will not buy. Consumers are going to configure what they want and when they want it. They can buy a lot less of what is just good enough at the lowest price in the standardized world and focus instead on quality. So business needs also to raise, uh, rather than lower, the respect that we pay to the intangibles of human labor. Uh, we need to put behind us this zero-sum idea of winners and losers so that people can concentrate on building shared value and success despite the failures that inevitably happen along the way. We're rich enough, I think, both materially and in spirit, to make this critical change in the organization. So we have to avoid thinking of on-demand labor as cog work. One interchangeable laborer could be replaced with another at any time. A maid, and I'm sure that many of you probably have had this experience, comes into your home and has to have tremendous soft skills to keep that job and to keep coming back. Um, and that maid has to be in demand for the on-demand company providing the connection to him 
to be successful. If the maid does not have the soft skills to continue to develop the relationship, the on-demand company ultimately will fail because the brand experience will be very poor. Um, and I think that companies that fail to deliver opportunities for workers that excel at relationship building are the ones who are going to be losing workers faster than anyone. An interesting conversation on the way over this morning with my Uber driver. He actually works for both Uber and Lyft all the time and simply takes the most recent call he gets. But he says Lyft is such a better deal for him. And he's looking for ways to increase his driving for Lyft. And in almost, in a way, sort of arbitraging within his own business model how he gets more money out of both of those companies. That's going to be an incredible stress uh, for local on-demand companies to manage as they move forward. So the agenda today is going to present many perspectives on where the local economy and automation and data interchange and the socioeconomic trends that are contributing to all this can go. Um, how do you take an economy that used to be one big supply chain with one big output and turn it into many supply chains with many different outputs? That's the, the big challenge here. And ways, the way that we're going to do that is with transparency. We talked today about uh, Holacracy. Uh, uh, Zappos now lets everybody in the company see everything that's going on in the company. That's actually the way that we're going to be customers in the future. We'll be looking through the entire business and deciding whether we want to be affiliated with them. Uh, so I think that creating APIs, uh, offering uh, transparency and more free flow of information will be in just nothing but good for these companies. But I don't think that everyone will adopt that. Uh, the other thing we want to be able to uh, come away today with is a clear sense of the fact that what works at one place and in one time is not necessarily going to work in another setting. Um, today we tend to think, you know, there's an Uber for this or an Uber for that. Well, that mindset is a dead end. It's just one solution to the problem. Uh, we, we, we need to think together about evolving markets and think about Uber as just one possible solution to the problem of transportation. Um, the reason to do this is, and if you think biologically, uh, you'll understand this, I think, monocultures die when they're shocked. And it's because they lack the components to use to construct a response to changing conditions. So I urge you to, to embrace a notion of the on-demand world that extends beyond the boundaries of major metropolitan areas um, and celebrates the tiny differences in life ways across the country. That's how you're going to be local in those many different places. Um, the level of complexity in human society is, as far as we know, the highest in the universe. Uh, we collect and use more energy per second per gram than anything that we've discovered in the universe to date. And Harvard astrophysicist Eric Chason graphs this and shows us how this has progressed since the, the dawn of time. I believe you can see that Moore's law is simply a, one more expression of this uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, that we, like, what chip fa fa fabrication is doing is riding a bigger wave as humans invent more complex solutions to the problem of living in the universe. And if you look at this graph, and this is, I think, a really important point, um, think of all 13.8 billion years of history as one day. Break it billions of years down into hours, minutes, and seconds. The entire modern era since 1700 fits into the last three tenths of one second of cosmic time. So we're really only getting started on the evolution of this marketplace and the economy. And if we don't destroy the planet, we are in for an extraordinary ride. But we have to work together in order to avoid destroying the planet. And now we face the inevitable impact of digital technology on the economy after talking about these threats and benefits for more than 30 years. Public and private organizations, local, state, and federal budgets healthcare and other social support systems, the fabric of all of our social relationships face wrenching change, but they face wrenching change all the time. And we simply have to be comfortable with that and continue to move forward. The ability to shape the inevitable is within our grasp if we avoid fixating on nostalgic defenses of familiar features of the present, which are actually simply passing phenomena. Uh, the workplace model may be returning to a much more ad hoc model, and I urge you to look at the career of Benjamin Franklin. The man did not have one job. He had a portfolio of things he did. 
Uh, we believe that we have the idea of a, a one career life. Uh, that is a, a product of the 20th century. And we shouldn't stick with the 20th century. We live in the 21st already. We need to move on. So we have to ask the question, is it more important to innovate on work styles or to preserve something like a 90-year-old idea of a job for life? I don't think this economy will turn out to be fair for, any, or for everyone, after all there are people involved. Um, but it certainly has to be fair enough to survive the judgment of the people living within it. And that's why looking at this in the big view is important. We're all riding a roller coaster together. And we want to come off it together at the end as well. Um, and the local on-demand economy is really the first great tool for doing so. It will allow neighbors to work together, to be in service to one another, and to monetize that exchange. Um, we estimate that nationally, 18% of the U.S. residents, uh, of U.S. residents, have convenient access to um, on-demand services within their region. And after adjusting to account for the unemployed and those who are simply too poor to pay for on-demand services, we estimate that in 2015, approximately 14 billion hours of previously unpaid household labor, that is the labor that people do around their homes, uh, is potentially in play for on-demand companies. This is a net new paying work, uh, uh, pay, uh, paying work inventory that could be done for a reasonably priced uh, by a reasonably priced on-demand worker. We also believe, based on this, that uh, uh, load represents the final integration of women into the measured economy. Women still do twice the unpaid labor in the home as men, and pricing that work by making it exchangeable on the local on-demand economy gives it recognizable value, and I think that's going to have a profound effect on how we look at the relationship between gender and employment. So let's look more deeply at two of the subcategories of household services, uh, housekeeping and laundry. So using the model I just described, 18% uh, of the population being able to access this uh, conveniently today, we estimate the housekeeping services vertical uh, is worth $57.8 billion in addressable revenue this year. Uh, that is, if we actually were addressing, uh, able to uh, achieve that kind of market penetration. In fact, uh, the traditional made business uh, only captures about $8.5 billion of that revenue. In uh, annual revenue, or in, and, and that's about 14.7% of the market. So there's a lot of opportunity there. On the other hand, laundry services account for about $35 billion in addressable revenue. Um, and Traditional laundries, dry cleaners, the coin-operated laundromat, and so forth, currently capture $25.6 billion of that industry, or 73.1% of it. So this shows that load companies, local on-demand companies, by the way, we will be using the acronym load and turning it into a word, and I'm aware that there are some funny ways to turn that, and that's one of the fun things about the phrase. Um, there's a whole load of stuff we'll be talking about. Uh, this shows that these companies have ample existing revenue to win away from existing companies, but their real opportunity lies in bringing this new labor and new newly monetized labor into the marketplace. So we're going to step now, or turn it over to Mike, to talk about how the business works. Thanks, Mitch. Hi, on. Hello. Good. Um, thank you. So with that kind of economic and historic backdrop, I want to drill down now into really what the on-demand economy looks like today as really an overture for a lot of the themes we're going to be going over throughout the day in different panels and keynotes. Um, so our definition, this comes from our, our white paper that we published on the local on-demand economy. At its very basic level, our definition is that load apps summon products or services on demand to be fulfilled or delivered offline, um, locally. It's a very local story. Um, so for users, that brings immediate needs to their fingertips. That very much resonates in an, in an increasingly on-demand culture, as we're going to go over. Uh, for providers, uh, load really aggregates demand for them, creates more transparent marketplaces, um, and reduces their customer acquisition costs. So when you bring that all together, it brings buyer and seller together more efficiently with leaner unit economics, excuse me, um, as I'll give a few examples of it in a minute. Um, so first of all, what's really driving this? So first of all, it's mobility. Um, so a you know, smartphone penetration and smartphone culture has really engendered um, 
a society that very much is conditioned to expect things on demand. I like to say that the mobile device is the remote control for the physical world. Um, you also have accelerating that millennials. Um, it's a generation for which the term on demand uh, could be even a tagline. Um, I hope I'm not um, um, insulting anyone by saying that. Um, and I think that um, that's really, given the on-demand economy, really kind of fertile ground to grow. It's really, it's really receptive to a lot of these um, uh, different demographics, but also geographic. Um, you know, urbanization, we have more people living in cities than ever before. So that creates a population density that very much allows uh, marketplaces to grow easier. Um, so there's also a lot about urban lifestyle that's conducive to on-demand services, um, not owning a car, not owning a washer dryer or a tool shed, and all these things that create gaps for on-demand services to fulfill. So for all these reasons and many more that we break down in our white paper, I won't go through all of them, it's really kind of creating fertile ground for this, um, this movement. Um, so really it's also about supply and demand imbalance um, and, and really growing those two sides um, in sync. So everything I just went over is really on the demand side. And demand is going to be pervasive. I think it continues to be pervasive based on all those very deeply culturally uh, rooted trends. So really the magic is in the supply. And what we're starting to see is companies that are being successful with load have a common element, which is they're able to aggregate previously disaggregated kind of sources of supply. And that's people's knowledge or their time. And it's, uh, it's Uber kind of marshalling all of these drivers and then also creating the, the matching algorithms and the logistical systems to then deploy that supply when demand happens in a very kind of lean way. Um, so it's really kind of finding that liquidity um, in supply. And really what's enabling that, again, is mobility. Um, and the data that mobile is able to provide in terms of where people are, who's available, and to, to kind of deploy them uh, locally in these logistical systems. Um, what I like to go back to is a quote from Brendan Benzing. And Brendan, I think you're here. I think I saw you walk in. Um, he doesn't know that I was going to quote him. Um, but actually, this is from our conference we did in uh, December. And you said something that, that really kind of stuck with me, which is that what we're talking about really here in this kind of formula of, um, of supply side optimization is yield optimization. Um, you know, Uber in the early days had a brick business, which was town cars. But it was all the time in between those rides that was the mortar. And that's the value that technology is really extracting due to mobility. Um, so, so this is really kind of at its base level, the formula we're seeing as a common element in a lot of um, on-demand um, kind of uh, marketplaces that, that, are, that are succeeding. So another um, attribute that I really want to spend some time on is the favorable unit economics that I alluded to earlier. So because buyer and seller are linked more directly and more efficiently, it tends to sidestep a lot of the parts of the supply chain that have traditionally caused margin compression. So having a building or a fleet of cars or a storefront or a, or a big marketing budget. Um, the, the, the economics are a lot leaner. And, and the best way to describe that is with a few examples. So one of them is, is Grubhub, not a company usually thought of as being um, one of the newer batch of companies in the on-demand economy, although you could argue that they're one of the originals in being in food order and delivery. But what they're doing recently is very interesting and I think very telling. So they're starting to work with restaurants that are non-sit-down restaurants. Um, and they're, they're doing this a lot in New York. So that's the case with a lot of catering companies and a lot of kind of um, chefs that are popping up. And the advantage that these companies have is that they don't have um, a, a restaurant. They don't have the bottlenecks of how many people they can seat per day. They don't have a wait staff. They don't have the, the polish and all of the operations and the reservation systems that are required in a traditional restaurant. So that significantly lowers their overhead. So Grubhub is working with them to basically aggregate demand for them and find them customers through a delivery system. Now the economics are so favorable because all of those overhead costs go away that the customer gets um, a very affordable meal. The, the chef or the, the kitchen that we're talking about here still gets pretty healthy margins because a lot of their costs have gone away and then Grubhub still takes a cut. So I think that kind of three-sided marketplace and how the, the, um, the economics are being reallocated um, are, are, is very telling of, of a lot of the models that are, that are thriving. Another example is an example I love. It's not a big dollar category, but I think it has some of the elements that really tell this story, which is car washes. Um, there's a company called Wipe. Like restaurants, one of the biggest cost structures of a car wash is real estate and having, you know, a, um, being on a busy intersection, being able to have people come in. Um, so what Wipe does is it deploys car wash professionals on demand to basically use your driveway 
and your hose and your water supply and all these things that, again, cut out a lot of that um, traditional overhead so that the economics are more favorable, the customer gets a cheap car wash, that car wash professional um, still gets healthy margin, and then there's still some margin for wipe to take as a cut. And the other thing that's interesting here is the way that these companies are being, or they're deploying that supply, in addition to having favorable unit economics in terms of the supply chain and overhead and everything I just went over, it's also interesting to note how they're deploying and connecting supply and demand in very efficient ways um, that, that is almost analogous in a retail sense to the just-in-time inventory system that was popularized in the 80s by Harley Davidson and others, where inventory, instead of sitting on a shelf and, and taking up um, eating up cash flows is deployed right when it is needed. So, um, you know, these companies are also working with that principle of um, kind of just-in-time service is kind of the, the mashup that I, would, that I would peg it with. Now, another quick example before I move on is Avo. Now, Avo is a company that um, has been around for a while, and they're working with, with lawyers. They're essentially a network and a directory of lawyers. Um, now, they decided to bring an on-demand kind of function into what they were already doing. Uh, because lawyers, are, what they do, as we all know, is they schedule their time and appointments in hour chunks throughout their day. And that leaves a lot of gaps in between of timelines that are an hour or less. And it's hard for them to liquidate that time um, and monetize it. Um, and it's really not worth their while um, to do so because of all of the processes around acquiring customers and scheduling and all these other things. So Avo came along and said, OK, let us do that for you. We'll handle the customer acquisition. We'll handle the scheduling and the payments. All you got to do is pick up the phone and answer the phone and give some legal advice. So um, what that has come down to is that because Avo is taking care of all that stuff, lawyers will charge less than their normal billable rates. So the economic model they've come up with is $39 for 15 minutes with a lawyer. Um, and that allows them to liquidate those smaller chunks throughout their day. And 15 minutes might not seem like a lot, but I actually tried this just to see if there's really some value there. And it's great if you are at the front end of a legal process. Um, instead of uh, what might be overkill and meeting with a bunch of lawyers, you can kind of get your ducks in a row, level set, find out what kind of legal artillery you'll need in 15 minutes. Um, and it's a very way, a good way to kind of atomize what was otherwise this kind of big, kind of heavy process. Lawyers also love it because it's a lead gen um, medium for them to kind of bring in people through these consults. So those are a few examples of just kind of the, the economics, how they're playing out. Um, so that's interesting, too. The, the other reason I bring up Avo is to say that um, you know, this on-demand model is going into almost every local vertical that, that we can imagine. Uh, we, we've, we've seen some pretty quirky ones, too. We're going to have a fun session later where we're going to kind of guess where they can, this can go next. Um, but I, I bring up Avo because it's not only moving into different verticals, but it's moving up the ladder to higher-end professions. Um, we're talking architecture. Design is a big one, I believe, it's going to grow into, where graphic design, getting a quick logo made for your company, or interior design. Um, and, and lawyers, doctors, we're going to hear from Heal uh, later um, with the kind of medical vertical. So um, the, the interesting thing here, too, is I mentioned millennials earlier as being avid consumers of the on-demand economy. One thing a lot of people aren't talking about is that they're also going to be very pervasive on the supply side. Um, if you look at the kind of characteristics of the generation being very um, uh, attuned to empowerment and flexibility, that's really what these load kind of gigs, as they're known, is, are known for. And as it moves up, the, up market, it's going to re be really appealing for a, another segment of the millennial generation that, are, that have higher levels of education or higher skill sets. Um, and it could really start to be the, the new way we look at how work is done, um, as it's not only in drivers and dry cleaning, as I like to say, but, but a, a higher swath or a larger swath of the overall um, working public. So um, winding down here, um, because load is bringing buyer and seller together more efficiently, before, because it's kind of compressing the supply chain, some of those other things I mentioned, it has the potential to displace local marketing as we now know it. And what I mean by that is that you know, local marketing is an upfront uh, budget that is created, an upfront campaign that is created um, in order to aggregate demand um, and um, acquire new customers. Now, load is almost achieving that same end of customer acquisition, but in a different way. So uh, an Uber driver, for example, um, instead of starting a uh, business of, um, of driving and taking out a Yellow Pages ad or a Google search campaign, simply joins a network where they are then deployed to meet the supply in real time. And for that, they pay 20% as they go for the scheduling, the customer acquisition, and the, um, and the payment processing. 
Now, for a lot of businesses, that's actually more tenable and more attractive because there's less upfront risk and upfront capital investment to kind of get going quickly. So um, that's kind of the basic model. And the question is, if that's the case, is that taking money away from local marketing as we know it, and the 140 billion that BI Kelsey now projects makes up local advertising. Now, I think that's a scary concept for a lot of folks that are local media companies that sell local advertising, but I think that the, the net effect will be more positive because the on-demand economy, though it will siphon dollars away from local marketing to some degree, will also um, basically increase the size of the addressable market of SMBs to those that don't currently advertise. So a, a little bit of math there, we have 27 million businesses, small businesses in the US, according to the SBA. Um, about 19% of those advertise according to our data. So that leaves the remaining 81%, which is about 22 million businesses, that are the addressable market for the kind of micro entrepreneurs that the load will really tap into. Um, so the question that remains is that can local media companies that currently serve different flavors of marketing and advertising packages either buy or build or acquire and kind of tack on load services as an overall bundle? And I think that the answer is that's a huge opportunity because it aligns with another trend we're seeing at BI Kelsey, which is over the last three years or so, we've noticed that local and kind of serving SMBs isn't just about sales and marketing anymore. It's a lot of other operational needs. It's not only helping them get customers, it's helping them keep them, it's payment processing, it's CRM, it's back-end stuff. Um, and and the, the benefit there for local media companies is that those things have a higher switching cost. So the retention is a lot higher. Uh, local advertising, one of the pain points has always been that the churn is so high. So this is really a play towards not only a larger addressable market, but higher ARPA metrics and things like retention. Um, and I think that that's really one of the opportunities that we see in the on-demand economy. Of course, there are so many facets to it, but um, how it affects and how it impacts the existing local media ecosystem is an important point that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more later. So um, really, the question that all leads up to is if my premise is correct, that it's bigger than the current addressable market of SMBs, the $140 billion in ad spend, if it's bigger than that, you know, how big are we talking? And Mitch alluded to some of these figures earlier and, and has a lot more and has done a lot to quantify this. So Mitch, I guess I'll pass it back to you at this point. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, can you go ahead and go out and check on Jeremy? I'll probably be next week. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to try to go quickly through the rest of this. <laughs> um, so we've identified three major business patterns. I won't call them business models because they are their components that you can mix and match uh, to create different solutions. And we're representing them here as three different variations on the current traditional funnel you may know too well from your own marketing. Um, and they are, and we'll start off with the branded vertical on-demand portal. Uh, that is uh, the one that we would think of when we think of, for instance, Uber or TaskRabbit or any of the other major, uh, and, uh, any of the unicorns. How are you? Um, so, Hey, Mike, we can hear you back there. <laughs> um, so these are very much like regular media companies, the ones that we already know. Uh, they're designed along the, the traditional funnel model. Uh, the transaction takes place at the bottom, at the end of all of the interaction that you're going to have with the customer. They finally say, yes, I want to buy something. Uh, you market these places as destinations. People need to come back to them for your, your customers, or who include your contractors, to be successful. Um, it's it's uh, a very recognizable business, and one that uh, um, I think uh, as, the, as we look at these unicorns, we should understand that they're valued that way because for many of the investors looking at them, they recognize the model and they can understand where it's going. Um, so, so let me just summarize the branded vertical on demand service assembles supply before demand is established and then advertises using traditional marketing and improved customer, uh, mobile customer service experience uh, essentially to win and keep their uh, customers. Now, one of the uh, keystones of Uberfication is this idea of interchangeability of, of uh, service providers. And in the branded vertical of service, uh, a lot of workers will just come and go uh, from the home and probably never come back unless there happens to be a coincidence in scheduling. Uh, but we believe, and we're pretty confident about this, that there will also be a successful model in some markets uh, where repeat business and repeat service by a single provider is critical. 
Uh, we have a, a, a attendee here today, for instance, working in the Medicare uh, area where uh, regulatorily they must provide the same provider to the customer every time or they're breaking the law. Uh, those kinds of services are going to build around the individual's success in building relationships and then uh, accrue value to the larger company. Um, that brings us to the second group here of uh, load models. And in this case, we tip the, uh, the, the funnel on the side to show that the transaction can take place at a lot of different levels in the, in the pyramid. Um, supply organizes itself through these systems, and they use tools to manage their outbound and inbound marketing, their scheduling, and so forth, uh, as software as services sort of CRM light tools that allows them to close transactional loops, gather reviews, facilitate word of mouth marketing about their services and about their personal brand. Uh, we also believe that uh, small and medium sized businesses will rely on these kinds of tools as well uh, to get into this market, as well as potentially partnering with companies like a porch to uh, have their service represented there. Um, so. Think of this also as an extension of the directory or pr online presence management business that's very familiar in local media today, particularly in the IYP market. Um, and we'll have a couple of speakers from this, this world, uh, Reach Local and Talk Local, who are expanding into this market. Then the uh, other thing about this is uh, there's a second group of very vertically oriented on-demand tools represented by a couple of speakers today, such as BreezeWorks and Freshline, that deliver category-specific tools for SMBs or the individual worker, such as you know, a tool specifically for somebody who provides service in the home, like a plumber or a painter, uh, or a tool for a, uh, a professional service to manage and uh, integrate an on-demand component into how they offer their services to the market. Um, and we've, we're, confi we're confident that uh, one of the things that people want most of all is tools to do this. They don't know how. Uh, Intuit will be talking later, so we'll DocuSign about the nature of uh, agreements and how we uh, integrate various services to facilitate those complex combinations of supply chains I was talking about before to deliver the really truly personal experience. Uh, this is a result from uh, Request for Startups, a Stanford-based uh, research group that uh, surveyed on-demand workers. Right now, 64% of them are using some form of tool to track their expenses, but you can see that they need help with schedule optimization. They need help with finding insurance or managing the payments for insurance. They need help in paying their taxes. A lot of on-demand workers will not be familiar with the idea of having to pay a monthly uh, payment to the federal government, uh, having been used to having it simply taken out of their uh, salaries before. So we need tools for that kind of thing, and they all occupy this second category. Um, and finally, we have what I would call the Wild West, the demand first search. This inverts the funnel entirely. In this case, it starts with the request. And the request is literally, I would spend money, this much money, right now, for this product or service in this location. And we have a, a company introducing its service today, Yellcast, that I think represents where this market is going. Uh, these services basically say, I want the following. And uh, we can imagine adding to that, begin that initial pattern lots of additional specifications that allow you to say, I want it uh, in blue. I want no slave labor involved in its production. I want it to be economically uh, or uh, ecologically or carbon neutral, for, for instance. And making that a requirement before you ever even begin the rest of the discussion about what that uh, transaction might involve, including all of the add-on services that go with it. Um, this is going to be distributed. It's going to be available through many sites, through APIs. It'll be bundled by marketers, including marketers in both the other categories, to make the services more widely available and to drive more and more traffic down to that individual worker who's building successful relationships with local customers. Um, and in this market, think about it this way. Um, Apple would know today that if they made an Apple Sport Watch um, that ran for three days instead of about, about one, uh, for $295 that I would buy it. But the fact is, um, I'll let them, if I could tell them that, I would just let them figure out when they can afford to have me as a customer, which is completely different than the way that Apple treats me today. Uh, they set their price, and if I can't afford it, I can't afford it. Well, 
Now there's a dialogue going on. And that's really an important uh, concept to think about here as you uh, look at this. Um, you can imagine Nordstrom, for instance, was really the paragon of customer service, uh, taking the uh, experience and beginning with a, a demand. I need three shirts. I want them in blue, and I want to pay $35 for them. I happen to like the John W. Nordstrom shirt, so I use that as an example. But this transaction, which uh, I will not read to you, uh, shows how I could do upselling, I could do concierge service, I could add uh, any number of other interactions or products or services to the final delivery. And in this case, you've started with the clear definition of a single transaction, but you may come out with any number of combinations of personalized results within the marketplace. That's profound, and that goes back to uh, something that was introduced by uh, the, the authors of the Clue Train Manifesto, uh, that markets are conversations. So real give and take conversations about products and services are engaging, and they're mutually rewarding, providing information to both parties in order to improve the success of the transaction. And with demand search, or demand first search, those transactions can begin anywhere. And that's a profound change in the way the business model is going to work. Um, so let's just quickly go back and look a little more about the impact on household spending. Uh, we believe that um, uh, we're talking here primarily about this, this unpaid household work. It's easy to spec because you can use the US time use survey. Uh, but it's also going to impact the, uh, uh, the enterprise in the future. Uh, and that, I think, is a market that is multiples of the numbers that we're about to talk about. As we said before, the total addressable market for uh, home services today is $465 billion. Um, we'll be de detailing findings about uh, specific verticals in upcoming research that Rick referred to earlier and about which you can find information on your uh, memory key. Uh, but um, all told, BIA Kelsey estimates that the on-demand household services market currently claims about $18.5 billion in revenue at this time today. But that's dominated by Uber, which accounts for about 60% of it. And Uber is not simply a household service. It's also a, a, a work-facing uh, uh, service for people who are traveling on business. So it's not a true household service. The total revenue for local on-demand household services today, excluding Uber, is about $6.5 billion. And the message of all these stats and the companies that you're going to see today is simple. There's a massive opportunity to change the world and to improve the lives of millions of underemployed and unemployed people, as well as to improve the lives and flexibility of professionals who are already overemployed and are looking for additional flexibility. Um, if the total addressable market for household services today were engaged by load companies, and they charged, as Uber does, a 20% uh, fee for facilitating that transaction, uh, there's $93 billion on the table right now. The problem is that we have not figured out how to address the market, and that's what we need to begin to do, to talk about how do we do that engagement. And that's what we're going to do with our next speaker, Joanna Lord from Porch. Um, so 